Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for that kind introduction, and, and thank you to John and Paul for inviting me and for hosting all of us, and thank you to the other presenters, uh, be, uh, beginning with Felix, on through everyone else. This has been a really stimulating event. Uh, so, thank you. George Mallory first glimpsed Mount Everest in 1921 as a prodigious white fang excrescent from the jaw of the world. A late, light haze obscured the peak. It, Mallory was not disappointed. A week later, um, still at a distance, he looked at the clouds where the mountain should be and could see a whole group of mountains through the clouds to began to appear in fragments, gigantic fragments. The mountain shapes for Mallory were like the wildest creation of a dream. Slopes, crests appeared in the sky, now one fragment after another through the floating mist until far higher in the sky than imagination had dared to suggest, the white summit of Everest appeared. George Mallory and Mount Everest became white a century ago. This whiteness, of course, was not the color of the snows, but the self-identity of the climbers. Mallory was convinced that these fragments could substitute the parts for the whole. Quote, in this series of partial glimpses, we have seen a whole. We were able to piece together the fragments to interpret the dream. Whatever remained hidden by the mists and clouds, Mallory was confident that the fragments had a center with a clear meaning, one mountain shape, the shape of Everest. Visions of Everest as a prodigious white fang should be reassessed now um, as we observe the centenaries of the British Everest expeditions. Over the last century, many climbers have followed Mallory's footsteps by art articulating or embodying whiteness on the peak. Some fragmentary glimpses of whiteness over the last century may appear as ephemeral as Yeti footprints in the snow while others have left a deeper impression. The durability of whiteness is one reason to celebrate the more recent accomplishments of people of color on Everest. Many Sherpas have climbed the peak 10, 20, or even more times. This spring in May 22, with the same illustration <laughs> shown earlier today, Lakpa Sherpa became the first Sherpa woman to climb the peak 10 times in the full, service, excuse me, full circle Everest expedition from the United States succeeded in reaching the summit to become the first all black and all brown expedition to the highest place on earth. When was the first all white Everest expedition? Was it Mallory's? Uh, they thought so at the time, a century ago. Even though the climbers who called themselves white, Saibs, English, British, European, or Western, were joined by coolies, Sherpas, Botias, and others who carried loads and were critical to the ascent, as we have heard through many presentations the course of the last two days. That the whiteness of the climbers is easy to overlook. You know an Everest climber is white, as Toni Morrison remarked about a character in Ernst Hemingway novel, Between the Wars, we know he is because nobody says so. In 1920, the year before Mallory's vision of Everest as a prodigious white fang, um, W.E.B. Du Bois declared the discovery of personal whiteness is, well, did I get the right, yeah. Um, the discovery of personal whiteness is a very modern thing a 19th and 20th century matter. In the souls of white folk, originally drafted for the war, published in Dark Water, 1920, Du Bois summarized the theory behind the colonial expansion as the duty felt by white U Europeans to dominate the darker world and use darker peoples as beasts of burdens for white folk. From the perspectives of other Everests at this event, we would agree with Du Bois that the, slot, excuse me, the title to the universe claimed by white folk is faulty and, like him, reject the assumption put forward at the time on Mount Everest and elsewhere um, that every great dream the world ever, dra <laughs> ever sang was a white man's dream. For Du Bois, the exploitation of men was as old as the world 
but had been implied by Europeans on an unprecedented scale. The imperial width of the thing, the heaven-defying de audacity, makes its modern newness. The imperial width of the stage, or let's add the imperial height of Mount Everest, led Du Bois to assert the deeper reasons for the triumph of European civilization lie quite outside and beyond Europe, back in the universal struggles of all mankind. To its promoters and publicists in the 1920s, the ascent of Everest symbolized the spirit not just of man, but the supremacy of white men. The non-whites, as Du Bois recognized, were not considered dark versions of white men. They are not men in the sense that Europeans are men, to put ourselves back into 1920, 1921. The filmmaker, John Noel, recalled Mallory's vision of Everest as the prodigious white fang, as the first time that white men had ever gazed from foot to summit of the peak. Um, for Noel, after the death of Mallory, the eventual ascent of Everest by white man would be, quote, a stirring victory for modern man and another step forward in the evolution of mankind. Um, so in this presentation, I want to consider the whiteness of Mount Everest at the end of the 19th century in the first half of the 20th century with a brief coda looking forward from 1950s to the present. So we'll, we'll proceed broadly in three sections. Um, first, how the mountain became white um, and how the climbers became saibs, a particular form of white man in South Asia, um, meaning in this case in India. <laughs> Second, after Mallory and Irvine's deaths in 1924, Everest became a symbol of white supremacy among climbers and aviators. The decade from the mid-1920s to the mid-1930s is remarkable for the intensity and repetition of explicitly racialized discourses of Everest as the white man's mountain. And third, um, we'll talk about the whiteness on Everest and as it evolved in the 1930s and 40s as Frank Smythe, Bill Shipton, and Eric, excuse me, Bill Tillman and Eric Shipton articulated white settler ideals of freedom in Himalayan mountaineering, including on Everest. These visions of white freedom of the hills became influential among later generations of mountaineers and climbers. And over the last 50 years, as Mount Everest became more commercial, it also became less white. In uh, indeed, I think it's fair to say that some of the criticism of commercialization over the last 20 or more years has been a, l a lament for the loss of white male privilege since the 1970s, which has intensified since the 1990s. So the plural histories of other Everests signals a difficulty, the challenge of arranging fragments over, that change over time into a singular pattern of whiteness or a steamingly stable shape like a mountain. According to Bill Schwartz, whiteness is not only a state of mind, it is also an external determining social relation that has lived historically in all its human emotional complexities. Studies by Sherry Ortner, Julie Rack, Patricia Pertschert, and others, at which many have been mentioned already um, in, these, in our dialogues, have examined the intersecting social relations of whiteness and gender in histories of Himalayan mountaineering. The influence of white supremacy in the 1920s and of white settler colonialism in the 1930s in shaping this white freedom of the hills and beyond have not received the attention that they deserve. Envisioning Everest as the white fang of a mountain has effects that linger, even if they are not pleasant to look at. So let's summon the determination recommended by Toni Morrison to defang cheap racism, annihilate, and discredit the routine, easily available color fetish, which is reminiscent of slavery itself. So, becoming sides, becoming white. Uh, Mount Everest and other Himalayan peaks became points, blank spots on a map, representing the whiteness of empire on the borders of British India. Of course, the space was not blank. 
as the peak had appeared in variations of Chomolungma on maps in China and Europe since the 18th century. And on the right is a detail of a map published in 1738 in London uh, listing uh, Chomolungma. Uh, there's the more widely reproduced version of this is in French as Chomolungma. Um, so the, the location and identification of its elevation led Colonel Andrew Waugh, director of the Trigonometrical Survey, to declare it his privilege and duty to, name, to give the peak a name that would be known for generations throughout the civilized world. A group of uh, surveyors, because there was controversy whether there were native names of the peak, which of course there were, but they determined just after the Indian mutiny had begun that since no European had visited the area, uh, they would, um, the name would remain because the local names were to Europeans unpronounceable. More could be said about the naming of the peak after Sir George Everest, former director of the survey, but I want to underscore that Mount Everest became white because during the 19th century, as, because of the, as the result of British rule of India during the 19th century. Uh, by the early 20th century, a sense of the world's highest peak were proposed to demonstrate the same conquest of the world that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, make sure, um, had identified as central to whiteness in 1920. I am given to understand, he wrote, that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. Many of the cast of characters that um, proposed the ascent of Everest around 1900 have also appeared in Schwart, uh, Bill Schwartz's The White Man's World, especially on the cover, George Curzon whose portrait is above the mantle just on the other side of this wall. If you have not had a look when uh, we're in the break, please you know, have a look. As Viceroy of India in 1905, Curzon declared it was a reproach that the two highest mountains in the world were either in India or on its borders of in neighboring states, that we, the mountaineers and pioneers par excellence of the universe, make no sustained and scientific effort to climb to the top of either of them. For Curzon, the ascent of Everest aligned with his policies that projected British power beyond the borders of India. An ex further example of this was the British invasion of Tibet in 1903 to 1904, perhaps its most notorious example. During that exhibition, excuse me, expedition, some members of the team went closer to Mount Everest than any white men had been before and got a closer look. And, and, but ironically, that invasion reduced rather than enhanced the prospects of a journey going to Everest because of its uh, aftermath. The British resident in Kathmandu in 1909 replied, turned down a request to ask for permission with a dose of real politique. It is of course extremely dull and tiresome here and it would perhaps be interesting to go to hither places hitherto unvisited by white men, but I see no good to be got out of it for the government and personal satisfaction is not to be considered in a matter of this sort, he wrote back to uh, Delhi. The origin myths of the 1920s Everest expeditions are well known. In 1919, Captain John Noel gave a lecture to the Royal Geographical Society in this building, <laughs> where we are today, uh, about his 1913 journey to Everest, followed by a well choreographed discussion which after some of the grandees who had been involved in proposing such an ascent spoke, the president of the Alpine Club, Norman Colley, noted that no white man has ever been within 40 or 50 miles of Everest and all the country around it is unknown, which garnered the banner headlines the next day where white man has never trod in the press. The next RGS president, Francis Yeo's husband who had led the invasion of Tibet, uh, a decade or so before, and a half before, became the public face and private lobbyist for the ascent, which he argued would elevate the human spirit in the battle of man versus nature. Tibet reluctantly granted permission to visit uh, Chomolungma, despite sacred uh, sites in the vicinity, in exchange for the ex uh, shipment of British weapons. The climber's passport uh, from the uh, Lhasa government instructed local officials to cooperate with the Saibs. You are to bear in mind, the passport says, that a party of Saibs 
are coming to see Cha, uh, Cha Mo Long Ma Mountain, and they will evince great friendship towards the Tibetans. Many British Everest, Everest climbers had been scythes for decades during military service in India, which, as you know, is defined broadly speaking as Europeans generally, or gentlemen initially, and then Europeans generally in India. That's how Hobson Jobson, you know, describes it. In contrast, at least one European alpine guide in the Himalayas in the 1890s was known as Gora, a term in India for a white man who is not a Saab. Mallory became a Saab and rejoined the male officer class. He'd been an officer during the war when he boarded the boat from, to Bombay. As usual, the racial tensions inherent in these imperial hierarchies were most, most clearly observed by someone who was marginal to this white male privilege. In 1930, Hedy Durenfurth, an accomplished German female tennis player who joined the Kanchenchunga expedition led by her husband, also became a memsab, a white married later on the boat to India. She confronted the color line when Frank Smythe told her she should not dance with young Indians who were on the ship. Smy um, Smythe explained to me that it simply was not done for a lady to dance with colored people. Not wanting to offend the really very nice Indians, I had no choice but to avoid the dance hall. I couldn't understand Smythe's point of view. The Everest expeditions from 1921 to 1924 renegotiated the roles of saibs and coolies and challenged saibs' assumptions about superiority. Early on, Mallory reported racing with one of the coolies as they approached the mountain in a walking race. And in July 1921, almost 100 years ago to the day, uh, Mallory and uh, Guy Bullock trained coolies in the use of ropes and snowshoes for the first time. The schoolmaster in Mallory was, impressed, was pleased with the lessons. He wrote, the coolies were apt pupils, and we felt that with practice on the glacier, the best of them should become safe mountaineers. Now, we'd heard much about the identity of the coolies uh, yesterday, uh, were identified on these expeditions as Sherpas, by and large, but not exclusively. And um, they were able to climb as far as any Europeans. Indeed, uh, Captain Howard Burry, the first le leader of the first expedition, thought they at, would an impro not improbably reach a height greater than any European once they received more training. And in 1922, uh, Colonel Norton wrote that most of, the coolie, most of them seem excellent walkers and climbers on rock and none too bad on snow. They offer, they offer to go and climb Everest if or when the sides are tired. I am not at all sure that they won't be competent to do so. Several of the climbers proposed bringing Saib's, um, let me make sure. This is a shot of the foot of the North Coal, and I haven't provided the, it, it's taking in the outline, but I think this was just before the avalanche too, in the same series that was shown yesterday. Um, here we are. So several of the climbers proposed bringing Sherpas back to Britain as servants to preserve the social relations of whiteness in 1921, George Mallory wrote to his wife that he wanted to bring, quote, bring one of the expedition coolies back as a servant. Nemo would do twice as much work as an English servant, including all the scullery work, the floor scrubbing, carrying coals, cutting firewood, fetching loads, waiting tables, asking as his personal valet. Would the other servants like him? Well, he is a clean animal, and although he would look a bit queer to them at first, they couldn't help but liking him. He's not very dark-skinned like, like a plains man. Mallory soon wrote to his wife to drop the plan, although the same arrangement occurred to Frank Smythe in 1936 uh, after repeating several journeys with the same porter. Uh, Nima Tendrup served on all three Everest expeditions in the 20s and then with Smythe on Kanchanchunga and Kemet and on Everest several times known as the old soldier for the Northwest Frontier Medal that he wore on his uh, br breast. He was a veteran of all these climbing, also of climbing expeditions on which porters were killed in 1922 on Everest and in 1934 on Nanga Parbat. Smythe wrote a chapter about his friendship with Nima in um, 
1935, and on Everest in 1936, he wrote um, home, I wish we had a man like some of these Sherpas about the place. I've been seriously considering bringing one, home this man and his wife. They're worth a dozen English domestics, but though they might be all right for a year, how could they be happy in the long run, away from their own people, in the bazaar, etc.? They all say, of course, how they would like to come, but I'm afraid it wouldn't do." Unquote. So the climbing abilities of the Sherpas and porters was described in increasingly racialized terms in the 1920s that reinforced the whiteness of the climbers. The Burisabs, this is General Bruce, uh, at the Mount Everest laboratory where the film was developed, <laughs> Um, before sent, being sent off to newsreels, um, was appointed in 1922 because of his prestige among the Mongolian people of both Nepalese and, Nep and Tibetan stock stood very high, for he understood these people as few white men do. Another expedition leader in the 1930s was kind of kicked out of the job because he wasn't considered good enough to deal with the white men who were on the expedition. He wasn't tough enough with them. In 1924, though, uh, Francis Young husband, Bentley Beetham, and others wrote that the porters might reach the top if, because they had the physical ability, but they didn't have the spirit. And there's many quotes to that effect. So before le leaving base camp in 1924, the climbers built a memorial stone cairn to those who died. And images of this were shown in at least one other presentation earlier. Um, Colonel Norton, the Burasab in that expedition, described the monument in these terms. On the highest stony hillock over the camp, outlined against the great mountain, which lured to their death those whose names it commemorates. Who can tell what white men will next turn the corner and see, for nothing ever changes in Tibet, the cairn, in memory of three Everest expeditions. In the decade after 1924, the deaths of Mallory and Irvine were sanctified by whiteness. These are screenshots at the end of the Epic of Everest film, the Noel film. Um, the intercultural encounter created by Noel's film, the Epic of Everest, and the performances of the Buddhist monks that uh, has been referred to resulted in the cancellation of Everest expeditions. And I've told this story else uh, before, but want to just have only recently come to appreciate the full extent to which the film is the cinematic counterpart to the racialized discourses of whiteness in his book. Um, the story of Everest, or it's called Through Tibet to Everest in a, a British edition. No viewer of the film can miss the closing intertitle that recalled the words of the Wrong Book Lama as an explanation for Mallory at Nervine's death. Strangely to memory, the words of the wrong book Lama come, the gods of the white men shall deny, deny you white men the object of your search. In his book, Noel embeds an arc of whiteness through the narrative from his journey to the region as the first white man, Mallory's white fang, the spirit of modern man, the encounters of white men with the Tibetans that made him uncomfortable. Laughter is universal in Tibet, he wrote, especially when a white man comes around. The white man is a strange object to Tibetans. They kill themselves laughing at him. Though the Superman of the porters, nicknamed the Tigers, could climb Everest more easily than any white man, in his words, they did not have the desire or spirit. And there's other versions, uh, descriptions of this in his book as well. He and Francis Young husband, in, um, gave this discourse a wider res, uh, circulation. And it was, becomes really about the uh, supremacy of man in the 1920s. Young Husband's book, The Epic of Everest, oddly, he received the name of the book that, accompanied, that, was the, that matched the name of the film. Young Husband's, Young Husband's book was possibly the best-selling Everest book in uh, between the wars, provided a condensed popular account of the big expedition tomes in the 1920s and some of the events in the, in the 1930s in the later editions that followed. And like previous accounts, um, he uh, put for, looked forward to the triumph of man over matter. In this epic version, Young Husband noted that hundreds of millions of Indians have through the ages looked up at the great Himalayan peaks, Himalayan peaks and not dared to think even of climbing them. 
even the minor peaks, much less the monarch of them all. Even for those living among the mountains, the idea of climbing never comes into their heads, he says. And he asked rhetorically, how is it that islanders from the North Sea should have thought of such a thing? So the English had followed de Saussure's uh, footsteps, and once the Alps were subdued and turned into higher game, Alpine climbers came to the Himalayas from every European country and from America. Everest was part of the perpetual struggle to establish the spirit of man's supremacy over matter. Man, the spiritual, makes means to make himself supreme over the mightiest of what is material. Young husband added in distinctly social Darwinist terms, Everest will accept defeat from none but the fittest in body, mind, or spirit. In Young Husband's account, the struggle for man's supremacy on Everest, it's difficult not to read his North Sea Islanders and Euro-American climbers and even man as signifying something other than white man. We know they are white uh, not just because nobody says so, but because he explicitly compares them in contrast to others. The faint-hearted people around Everest fear to attract, to attack, uh, um, fear to approach it. They have the capacity of body to reach the summit any year they like, but they are lacking in the spirit. Young husband concluded by hoping that uh, they would carry the Himalayan peoples with them uh, to the top, and named those who had been to the higher elevations, including by name porters. Uh, Nabu Yishe, Lakpa Chedi, and uh, Sem Chumbi, the stout-hearted and sturdy-bodied porters who showed that a high camp could be placed near the summit, as well as Mallory and Irvine, the others who had uh, gone high. So, young husband declared that, uh, without doubt, one day man will conquer the mountain. In the copy of this book, his book, archived in India in the viceregal libraries, and now in the collection of Indian Ministry of Culture, a reader, presumably after 1953, had underlined the sentence man, or sorry, the word man in the sentence, and wrote in the margin, Tenzing. <laughs> sorry? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, correct. So in the 1920s and 30s, though, that is two decades in the present, um, the deaths of Mallory and Irvine joined fa fallen polar explorers in contributing to the greatness of the British race, according to George Finch. Finch was a scientist who'd reached record heights in 1922 using oxygen apparatus, and he was an outsider in many respects. He was Australian, educated in Europe, and he was very critical of the, organi the climbing organizers, and therefore was excluded for some of the later expeditions. Um, but he wrote a, summary, he, a kind of climbing autobiography that is published just before the 24 expedition, and then a summary of these Everest expeditions that was suppressed in English for a while, but translated and widely circulated in Germany. For Finch, as for Nolan Yuz, hung husband, there was, this was a country no white man could enter. He emphasized the work of the team uh, as contributing Saib and Porter alike. Um, and the long roll call of victims, he, he did not name names, but he had two men who died in the prime of life, uh, almost a stone's throw from the top. What was the good of the ascent, he said, in pounds, shillings, and pence? Nothing. The things that have made great countries great was the spirit of adventure. Their sacrifice, therefore, followed the pattern of polar exploration. The great white ways to the North and South Pole are paved with the bones of British pioneers. And over this heroic paving, the adventurous sons of other nations have been first to gain the farthest points of the earth. Is it too much to hope that after the sacrifices that this nation has lain upon the foot of Mount Everest, the conquest of this last farthest point of our globe may fall to the credit of one of the British race? The so white freedom, several dimensions of it. By the 1930s, many of the younger climbers had cut their teeth on smaller expeditions in the Himalayas or in East Africa. In the 1930s, amid the demands for Indian self-government, tensions of white settlement in Kenya, the rise of fascism in Europe, 
and new, for new formations of whiteness emerged alongside the old ones. Though the supremacy of the British Empire attained its appeal to many, uh, the hypernationalism of the German climbers and British aviators uh, in the Himalayas made it less attractive to some of the climbers. But climbing histories often exaggerate the contrast between the smaller and the larger expeditions in this period, as if small somehow meant ethnically unproblematic. These new forms of whiteness, which I want to consider examples of white freedom, emerged across both the large and small teams, with white paternalism of trusteeship and partnership, which is kind of conferred by noblesse oblige, or the white freedom of the hills, in which individual climbers stake their claim individually and assertively uh, for themselves. So, um, in 1931, Frank Smythe led a, large, a smaller team to the summit of Kamet, uh, one of the highest peaks entirely within British India, supported by porters from Everest expeditions. And as they went into the hills, Smythe was relieved to be a white sob once again. We were no longer in the range of Gandhi's activities, and after the insolent stares of the Congress walls of the lower hills and plains, it was pleasant to be greeted with a respectful and friendly salam sob, salam huzoor from the villagers we met along the path. Smythe shared attitudes towards Indians, typical of the Raj in the 1930s, that we would now call racist, as implied by his comments to Hedy Durenfurth on the boat to India. In 1932, Smythe thought India would not be fit to rule itself for a century, quote, and to abandon her to be equivalent to putting all the animals of the zoo in one cage, unquote. On the journey to Kamet, they encountered Hindu pilgrims rather than the Buddhist pilgrims that they met on the way to Everest. Um, but the steam team still depended on Sherpa and Bhotia porters they had hired who, based on their previous experience, hired in Darjeeling based on their previous experience in India. It, his description of the, these porters, unlike the sullen-faced, suspicious Hindus of the plains, these Bhotias are friendly, cheerful, and happy-go-lucky people reflecting their broad grins and graceful salutations, the freedom and camaraderie of the hills. Smythe's film of the ascent, Kamet Conquered, a still, opens with the white spirit of adventure um, and closes with scenes of them pushing one of their Sherpa porters in front of them onto the summit first. As they reach the summit, we serve, seized hold of our Sirdar Liwa, we've seen in some photographs, previously in presentations, and shoved him on ahead of us so that he should be first on top. It was, I think, the least compliment we could pay to those splendid men, all porters, to whom we owed the whole success of the expedition. Liwa received severe frostbite in this ascent, and he did, there's evidence, I've discussed elsewhere, so, but that he did not consider this an honor. <laughs> It was more likely that he thought they were testing the vengeance of the summit gods on him rather than on them, because when they, and they came back down, none of the other Sherpas would go back up for another ascent. The gods of the mountain had burned Liwa's feet, and uh, they were not going to go up again. Um, so, uh, but it, the British view of this act of generosity, in their view, it was perceived as an example by Smythe of interracial cooperation and British grace, grace and tutelage as depicted in the scenes of the climbers and porters carrying each, each other's frost-bitten feet. Um, the, uh, on Everest, so oh, I should give some <laughs> description of the images. Um, on the left is Liwa's toes, which are the severely frost-bitten toes, but they pair that image with uh, clearly an image of one of the porters massaging the feet of one of the climbers. Um, and that recipro reciprocity was real. I mean, they, they thought of this as uh, an act of, we'll call it trusteeship or partnership. It's that form of whiteness is where Smythe is located. On Everest, Smythe and the expedition leader, Rutledge, articulated their vision of partnership with the Sherpas and porters, this whiteness of paternalism, uh, one that looked forward to a more collaborative uh, future of a sense, one which was echoed quite often in the 1950s. In 1933, Rutledge explained the climbing plan to all the porters, and one Sherpa said, 
We mean to do our bit and carry those loads as far as we possibly can. You'll see tomorrow. Then it's up to the sides to climb the mountain. Rutledge was impressed. There was no noisy demonstration, just a quiet statement of fact and complete self-confidence. Again, his notion of demonstration is comparing this to what is going on in India at the time. Um, Smythe remarked in the exact same incident, this exchange, and by saying, many of us hope that one day one of these men, meaning the porters, will be given the opportunity of standing beside his employers on the summit of Mount Everest. It would be a fitting climax to the job." End quote. White supremacy planted its metaphorical flag on Everest when several British pilots flew over the peak in biplanes in 1933. A group of British aviators wanted to demonstrate the superiority of British technology and planned to fly two uh, Westland biplanes over the summit. For financing, they turned to a right-wing Scottish widow, Lady Houston, who explained why she supported the flight. This made me feel some great deed of heroism might rouse India and make them realize that though they are of a different race, they are British subjects under the King of England, who is Emperor of India, and what more could they want than that? Indians loved great deeds, she said, and the flight seven miles into the air over India's highest mountain, for this is surely proof to them that the pluck and courage are not dead in our race, and perhaps, who can tell, this may make them remember all the advantages and privileges they have enjoyed under English rule. Now, the English side of that story has been well told by other scholars, uh, and I just want to add for now that the Everest flights, the Everest flight books and film, Wings Over Everest, were something of an embarrassment for the climbers, both for the success of the endeavor and for its rhetoric. Young Husband and others had long said that the ascent should be made on foot, the ascent of Everest, not powered by technology. But the discomfort came as much from the similarities of their rhetoric as from its differences to the technology. Um, the similarities in the rhetoric of white supremacy and English rule over India came from both the climbers and the pilots. Um, so the Everest flights, intriguingly, were also covered by the Tibetan language newspaper in, in uh, Kalimpong, the Tibetan Mirror, which led it to re-examine the name of Mount Everest. And you'll see in the center panel the, the tr English translation of this alternate name um, is the Snow High Blue Queen, which is not Chomolongma. It's another set of words in Tibetan. Um, and you have an image on, of a climber on the left and of one of the pilots on the right. They uh, mostly were uh, copying the illustrations from the, the Illustrated London News and from uh, some other photographs that were taken um, that appeared in the British press. The white freedom of the hills, of the colonial settlers. So two white settlers in Kenya, Bill Tillman and Eric Shipton, became influential climbers in the 1930s and their experience as white settlers in shaping the Himalayan climbing has been severely underestimated. Shipton and Tillman climbed together, uh, and initially separately and then together, Mount Kenya, Kilimanjaro, Ruwenzori, the Mountains of the Moon, but arrived in Kenya via different paths. Tillman's father was a prosperous merchant in England. Um, Shipton's father was a settler in Ceylon who died when he was young. Tillman was granted land in the Mao Forest in the Kenyan highlands in a program for veterans of the Great War that required such a substantial outlay of capital that it was in fact limited to the wealthiest 3% of people in England, which included Tillman. <laughs> um, Shipton arrived in Kenya as a laborer before working his way up to having his own farm. Before the Great Depression's effects were felt and essentially in a lot of, he and many of the other farmers left their, uh, their plots, abandoned their farms. Well, let me see, uh, Tillman was a, a, essentially a white hunter when he arrived, whose East of African trophies turned from big game to big mountains. When he arrived in Kenya, he said, a big game country, he said, like everyone there, he felt an urgent desire to go out and kill something and reported that hunting gave him the feeling of his fellow feeling for prehistoric man. Um, Tillman was anxious to demonstrate the deadliness of the white man's rifle before the, the porters who came with him. 
by shooting an elephant or some other big game. Uh, but doing this in front of an expectant crowd of porters gave him the feeling of, quote, a nervous and skillful, unskillful golfer driving off in front of a critical swarm of caddies. Tillman's memoir, Snow on the Equator, described his game and peak bagging, as well as his solo bicycle journey across Central Africa through Uganda, Belgian Congo, and French West Af Equatorial Africa to Cameroon. Um, he avoided bicycling in Kenya as much as he could for the unwanted attention he would attract as a white man there. In tropical Africa, as in India, there's a tendency among natives to despise white men who do not work with their hands or walks instead of riding in a car, he said. Tillman described that residents of one district as scarcely human with comparisons to Darwin and thought being watched while eating was like being a lion in a zoo without bars. Tillman's anti-black racism and commitment to white supremacy were rooted in legacies of empire that predated his 3,000 mile journey across, a bicycle journey. Eric Shipton found variety and freedom while climbing and farming in Kenya. Farming in East Africa sounded like a good sort of life, one which offered reasonable freedom of scope, not just for making a living, but for wider interests as well. He meant the climbing. He climbed in the Alps and was invited to climb Mount Kenya, which is making its second ascent after Halford Mackinder had made the first in the 1890s. And like Tillman, he, they com both compared their experiences uh, climbing in Africa with earlier explorers of Africa. And here I've got two different extracts, you know, um, Tillman said, one can still find this experience in Africa of your boyhood green, dreams, the dreams inspired by writer ha Haggard, Selous, Stanley, and uh, Shipton describing their trip to Ruin, Ruins Wari, um, which has then named peaks known as St Stanley and Speak. So is it easy to realize with what excitement those early explorers first set eyes on the snow peaks after traveling many miles through the swamps of Central Africa? These East, East African ascents led to invitations to climb Kamet for Shipton in the expedition we mentioned earlier, Everest, eventually for both of them, Nanda Devi, which Tillman goes on to make the first ascent of, um, but in a prior and unsuccessful ascent in 1934, Shipton wrote that we uh, lived with a perfect sense of freedom and deep physical well-being and Tillman, too, had abandoned himself to a life of self-indulgent freedom. That's in, after the 1934. Shipton, while on Everest, um, well, let's put it this way, freedom is the keynote for Shipton, much more than for Smythe or for Tillman. Climbing provided a delicious freedom and an escape from the slavery of daily life. This is a, a, um, a theme emphasized by all three of these climbers. Um, Smythe, uh, in 1937, now I had escaped in some way from this slavery to schedule and was free to enjoy some of the wildest grandeur in the uh, wildest country in the world. Shipton, um, in Upon That Mountain, um, well, we'll let's skip that, but in contrast, he writes, free from all the tiresome and restraints of normal life, encircled by the boundless horizon, one, of, one is all the more slave to the elementary considerations of time and distance, food and warmth weather and season, the elemental things, not the um, demands of ordinary life. So, um, so my stack of things tipped over earlier, and I want to make sure I'm <laughs> getting to the right um, spot. So both of them, Shipton's position was not white supremacy, nor this white trusteeship, but was what I'm gonna call white freedom. And Tyler Stovall, uh, American historian of France, has written a book, it's come out in the last year or two, called White Freedom, The Racial History of an Idea, which is really quite good, quite important to this theme. Stovall argues that modern ideas of freedom have been racialized since the 18th century, 
with whiteness and white racial identity considered intrinsic to modern liberty, autonomy, and self-empowerment. In a kind of summary statement definition, Stovall defines white freedom as the belief and practice that freedom is central to white racial identity and that only white people can or should be free. Unquote. Part of Stovall's argument is that the nationalist struggles against colonialism and the global wars against fascist racism in the early to mid 20th century undermined this, the idea of white freedom into the mid 20th century. To the, and it's been in something of a resurgence since 1989, circa 1989. In Himalayan mountaineering, relations with Sherpas and other porters follow a similar trajectory, of, if perhaps not the same timeline. Um, comments like, we soon came to regard them, the porters, as fellow mountaineers rather than as servants are easy to find. That is from Eric Shipton, writing in the 1940s. But the practices of mountaineering that they describe in the same accounts do not sound like the partnerships of someone who they consider an equal, or who is equally free, put it that way. So the, those practices tell a different story, and there are those wider range of stories that are among those that the Everest other Everest's network will, I think, bring to our attention and bring to life. Not until 1952, when two Swiss Everest expeditions make Tenzing, Nor Tenzing Norgay, a full climbing mem member of the climbing team of professional guides, mountain guides from the Alps, were the Swiss climbers, did the change in practice kind of align with some of this change in discourse. Tenzing Norgay and Raymond Lambert, a professional alpine guide from Geneva, famously camped high in the mountain uh, uh, before a final push to the summit. Like previous European climbers, Lambert was effusive in his praise of my assault companion, the most magnificent of the him splendid Himalayan Sherpas, Sirdar Tenzing, a force of nature, is one of the strongest men physically and morally on whom I have ever relied in my endeavors. Quite simply, I must say that I, the guide, had the uh, confused impression of, for once, being the client. They left the highest camp, and Lambert uh, said they looked like two deep sea divers moving underwater against the current. But their roles also against, ran against the current of whiteness associated with his occupation. Lambert recalled, this curious feeling comes over me. Am I the client? Is Tenzing the guide or the opposite? I don't know, but the impression is new. Truth be told, we alternate making tracks in the snow, one then the other, without thinking too much. As you know, they didn't reach the top <laughs> in 1952, but Tenzing returned a year later as Sirdar in the British expedition, and when they met in Kathmandu, to gather for that team. They were, went to the British Embassy where the Sherpas were put in a, uh, a garage recently converted from a stable uh, for their uh, accommodation until the Sherpas said, we're out of here, and went and found themselves other uh, accommodation in Kathmandu. After that initial uh, you know, inauspicious start, uh, the Sherpas and Saibs worked well together and they reached the summit, as we all know. Um, and here you see a photograph of Hillary and, and Tenzing, George Lowe, and Tom Stobart looking at the rushes of the film, The Conquest of Everest, that took place. Um, it appeared the following year. So in closing, I want to highlight some of the fragments of whiteness that suggest continuities in white freedom in the so-called Everest Brawl of 2013, almost uh, 10 years ago, as representative of some of this, have these patterns from, that we've talked about from earlier, remain in circulation. Groups of European and Sherpa, European climbers and groups of Sherpas were on the same part of the mountain slope up on the Lhotse face where the Sherpas were fixing ropes to lead commercial teams to the top when these other climbers came and there was a, a violent arc, uh, 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 altercation in which words, fighting words were exchanged on the slope, which led to a confrontation and violence in the Camp 2, one of the upper camps on, on the mountain. 
the three European climbers, who in this sense I think we have to call white climbers, were climbing on their own to acclimatize in the same area where Sherpas were fixing the rope for these larger groups. And a report at the time said that the three Europeans feel that Everest, just like every other mountain, should be open to all any time, unquote. I think they were quoting, quoting Uli Steck um, for that. Steck and his partners called their team the No Two Limits Everest Expedition. And as a sort of, you know, poor play on words of no, o they were not using oxygen. So there's no O2, but there's no limits. Um, and their assertion of this unfettered and absolute freedom of movement was almost a parody of similar campaigns by climbers in Europe or North America who assert a con this kind of freedom to climb anywhere, anytime, <laughs> no questions asked, no limits. According to Tashi Sherpa, one of the members of the rope fixing team, Sherpas risked their lives but didn't get any credit. Quote, even in documentary films like Into Thin Air and Everest, you don't see us, you, you don't see Sherpas. We've been left out. Resentment was always there, but deference and fear of losing their job had been replaced by a newfound confidence. Sherpas benefited from mounting, but so did whites, his word, and the Nepali government. For us, he said, Everest is a goddess. We worship it before embarking on an expedition. I think the relation between Sherpas and foreign climbers is still good. It has been strong and cemented over the years, working together for a goal. But this incident was waiting to happen, and it will happen again as long as Sherpas are humiliated. The whiteness of Mount Everest is visible in multiple fragments that provide diverse perspectives on its history, ranging from white supremacy, white paternalism, to white freedom. Mount Everest is certainly the highest, but far from the only, mountain where the white freedom of the hills is asserted with troubling ethical and political consequences. The excellent presentations over the last uh, two days during this Other Everest conference suggest that the strides that have been made and the work that there is still to do. Climbers cannot assert a right to climb anywhere, anytime, as if, uh, if, as, as if they had that right, as if they alone have that freedom. And they cannot do that if we are to defang the prodigious white fang of racism on Everest and beyond. As James Baldwin wrote in The Fire Next Time to mark the centenary of the uh, emancipation from slavery in the United States, white people are trapped in a history which they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. So let's do that work and ask for more humility, not just for white humility, but humility before the mountains. So thank you very much.